name is Mauro Fiorese. I'm 46 years old. I'm an artist, but I'm also a patient. As an artist, I devoted my entire life to photography since I was 19, I was very young. And as a patient, I was diagnosed with a stage four lung cancer in July 2014, and, and I'm working on it. I found out I wanted to be a photographer when I was very, very young. Uh, there was a little epiphany, and also the biggest gift from life from a career standpoint. Basically, for the last 25 years, I've been photographing and exploring the world inside and outside myself with the idea to, um, to have a vision to share with the world. And I think what pushes me to do so, uh, and is still pushing me to do so every day, is curiosity. And curiosity is probably pushing me so many times in troubles, but it's also what allowed me to, to do things that I wouldn't expect to ever achieve. And I guess it's also what is saving me from dying today. I'm going to show you a little bit of what I've done till today. My very first work is called First Reading. Uh, I was really about street photography and experimenting in the beginning of my career, the media and the people, especially in Europe. Then the first real project and book I did was about a social issue, about handicap, um, ironically, <laughs> entitled Free Body, and try to understand better what we call different and why we call it and we consider it that way. Um, last, uh, later I published a long-term project called Aula Day to understand the sense of living uh, and believing in the God I grew up with by looking at religious iconography in everyday life. As advertised as a work to explore the city I was living in, New York, which is the most photographed city in the world. Um, Once Upon the Blue was all shot in Italy, and uh, lakes, hair, restaurants, and people by water and blue were the predominant color. Another long-term project, about 12 years, that's pretty curious, called UFOs, Unidentified Photographic Subjects, explores the possibility of the medium uh, to create a subject or stage in a situation that doesn't exist in order to make it plausible to the audience as a kind of real evidence. Dream of a Place of Dreams is a book about another smaller city, Monte Carlo. I was hired to do this while at work uh, in a more surreal and poetic way than actually is and um, how it is always photographed. Eureka is a project that I want to be inspired, I want to homage light, especially the lights we can't see with our eyes. Mind Map of Love was a beautiful commissioned body or work by a friend, German friend collector about couples um, around the world. And the last body of work I'm working on is called Treasure Rooms in my gallery, Box Art from Verona, which is, um, shows hidden art in the works of amazing museum storage, where you can't see art and nobody's allowed. So it's kind of a bringing them back to our eyes. So this is basically a very condensed presentation of what I've done till today, both in terms of subject and styles. But the best part of being creative is that um, every time I start a new project, I also try to understand myself better, uh, both as a man and, and as an artist, by building my own position toward that subject and by creating my own photographic style that goes with it. So long story, make it short, in the summer of 2014, my body told me that there was something strong, wrong on my upper chest. And uh, so I asked a friend to drive me to the ER and then the rest is history. Of course, we all want to be um, safe and you know feel good, but a few months before, I was driving my motorcycle and I had a terrible motorcycle accident. This is what I call my training because, you know, I've been spending one year in surgery, rehab, and not working, a lot of problems, and I, you know, I was not ready for that, of course, but let me say first, I think we all are unprepared for pain in general, being, you know, physical or psychological, and no matter how much pain we already suffered before in the past. So you may say, damn, you're lucky, you know, <laughs> you got an accident first, then a cancer, what the hell? But, uh, you know, that's really, uh, paradoxically, I have to thank that accident because it really helped me to be, to be stronger and more ready to face and live uh, with a stage four lung cancer today. At the very beginning, I thought, oh, I don't deserve to be so sick. I mean, it's not fair. Why, you know, but is there anybody who deserves to be sick? Nobody deserves it, it just happened. Only after a while, I understand that I can't pretend to be healthy anymore. As I was before, I can't avoid it. I have to face it, but most of all, I have to accept it in order to fight it. Because this kind of disease is covert. It's a very subtle in the beginning, and maybe for a long time. And uh, when it comes up, it's like an atomic bomb. <laughs> it involves everything in your whole body and your mind, and those surrounds you. It changes everything. You know, cancer changes everything, especially at this stage. You know, and no, I'm not saying anything new, but the point is how to face it. You know, hey, if you're an artist, anything could be a source of inspiration for you, a great inspiration. Plus, at the same time, what you do can be inspiring for other people to get in contact with your work. Uh, and plus, the actual process itself 
you know, at least for me, of making art in all its phases from the idea to production can be really therapeutic in many, you know, many different ways. And also art can change a lot of things. And also, I know that I want to keep making art until the last day of my life. So this time, I decided to use the same tool I always use, but in a more, let's say, diaristic way than I ever did before. And again, using photography, the images you see are part of a documentary movie they're doing in my story. And it's, it's my daughter, Leda, who is actually by far the strongest medicine I ever tried. By doing so, I was exploring probably the first period of my life in order to let the people know what they eventually could expect, you know, or their loved ones in such a case, or simply to remind them how lucky they are to, to, be, to be healthy, not to, to be sick. So this time, uh, curiosity again was the engine, but fear was the fuel, and it was a very effective one. And as an artist, I was driving like a Formula One racer in a track of disease, but as a patient, I was feeling like an 80 years old man. And then I created, I created this visual and written diary called Lirbrun Cancer, based on what I've learned and I'm still learning about cancer and about myself. And there was so much involved that images weren't enough. So I decided to add words, my thoughts. They became part of all this. And I started for the point that I was born under the zodiac sign of Libra, <laughs> but my ascendant was not cancer, but I have one. So I started ironically, you know, from the idea that the zodiac become, um, sometimes for many of us, we believe we can predict and control our life by you know, looking at planets or listening to some prediction made by somebody else for us. And I love reading the horoscope, actually. You know, uh, I believe in the force of nature, but, you know, but I really like to study and, and, and get into deep uh, things that I'm interested to. So when I was diagnosed, um, of course, I was shocked. I moved to my brother's place, uh, which is by the sea. And I stay by the sea, and I look at the sea like a Zen monk for, for a week. And I was waiting for an answer or for an inspiration to come. And then I woke up, finally. I started researching like crazy, like I'm on fire. I did first on the web, which was a big mistake because, you know, web is, is too much. You, know, you just need to be guided. Then I called my friends who were doctors. I, I, I went to meet specialists in the United States. I talked to patient researchers. I met the people who run this company, collect data. I've seen videos of interviews by patients with cancer. I've seen tons of TED Med conferences by oncologists and so forth. I, that's why I created Libra and Cancer. I wanted to share all this information uh, with the rest of the world through the more inspiring and uh, creative way. They could be sometimes very straight, because you've seen sometimes pictures are showing you know, my nose bleeding or my you know, skin rash, or, but sometimes they're very ironic and aesthetically more stimulating. So I wrote the first chapters like, uh, I was like on fire. I remember I wrote one just on a round trip flight from New York with all the pictures. I was really feeling this responsibility toward people like me to let them know more about what, what I was doing and how, not, not because I was special. So Libre Cancer became uh, something popular in my country in Italy, so a newspaper wrote about it. I was invited to National TV on prime time to talk about it. It was kind of crazy, but a few days after the show, I, was, I received almost 200 emails. And um, people, patients, who you know, mainly say how good I was to make it through the disease. And I remember a lady, she wrote me that she was watching TV with her husband who was sick and depressed, and she said, see, he made it. See, he's okay now, you can do it. So of course, I have to answer to clarify that I, I didn't make it from a clinical standpoint. I was working on it, I was not healthy again, but I was definitely not depressed, and I was working hard, and I was making it every day. That, that was the difference, that's the miracle of life, and just being here. Now, uh, and of course, you know, it's hard and it's, it is still today. I explain everything in the chapters. I just don't hide anything. A lot of side effects, there are so many, you know, bleeding, diarrhea, vomiting, hair loss, skin rash, tons of medicines. The so popular chemotherapy that scares everybody. I lost clients, I lost friends. Some of them passed away during the battle, I lost money. I lost my hair. You know, some people ask me, how can you be so positive? But you know, I, of course I don't like it. I just would trade it with anything. But because of all this, I'm, I'm becoming a better man, I think, and a better artist, and definitely a better father. So I help myself in different ways. I change my diet, change my lifestyle. I choose now, and I don't let people choose for me anymore. It's, it's a matter of choices. You may find it a little arrogant, but uh, I also change my relationship with doctors uh, and my oncologists, and I love it. But being in their shoes, uh, I understand I've studied most of the existing cures they showed me for my case from adenocarcinoma, and I know now how frustrating it could be for them sometimes not to be able to make it, and actually most of the time knowing they're not going to make it at all because their success is based on 
helping us to live a little longer. And there's something very inspiring that I learned also through this journey with doctors and that we artists and doctors have something in common. We were joking about it before. I first say that sometimes we have both a big ego because we think, you know, we save people and we, we're God, we can create, uh, we have these possibilities. And I think art really have also such a responsibility, of course, medicine does, but for both of us, a job, our job is, uh, is our life. So it's a mission, it's based on passion. What we know for sure about cancers today, they are starts with the sort of breaking of a balance. And this balance involves body and soul and mind, and there's a reason it's not just one. The first few months, everybody was asking me, how is it happening? What was it? I, I know that I have some mutations. Unfortunately, my mutation is, un is uncommon, so it's a more complex, but I don't know if they're yet responsible for my cancer. So there are so many factors around, you know, could be pollutions, could be uh, wrong food, shock, you know, failure, genetic predisposition, so many things. But I, as a photographer, have been printing a document for many years with, with chemistry, you know, sodium hyposulfite. I love being a dark room. I've been staying in dark room for 10 hours, you know, with this beautiful arcane chemistry, the red light, the atmosphere, but drinking my beer, listening to jazz music. It was just magic to see the pictures coming out. It's part of the, you know, it's part of your, your passion. But for some reason, it sounds like everything starts from your hypothalamus. So like our immunodepression and all the consequences are kind of related to that. I'm not scientific man, so I'm not talking that way, but uh, we're so lucky to have people who study in order to find solutions for our health, and we're lucky to have great physicians and oncologists to help us. But I think we, the patients who are sick, should help them back in the way that I just said. So the main theme here in the World Economic Forum this year is the fourth industrial revolution. And of course, the healthy industry is a very big slice of this cake called economy. So from very little experience that I have, at the other side of the market. I'm a consumer, I'm not a customer, but there's so many decisions involved on, from both a scientific and an economical standpoint, but there are only a few people who can take this decision. So since even with the, all the money in the world, we just can't buy our health back, uh, I think the magic word in this field and market should be sharing, sharing really, uh, if you want to sound as connecting. So, Recently, I met a guy in New York through my brother who built a company years ago who are collecting scientific data from a huge amount of patients with cancer in the U.S., and he's making it available and accessible to be shared between doctors, researchers, and patients through an amazing cloud system. So when we all can have access to information, we all, at any level, we can grow. Uh, we're all more free. So yesterday, in his opening speech, American Vice President John Biden pointed out I think with Dr. Collins, that we are today living a big data era of cancer, but we should be able soon to move to a big data access era. From data, doctors can, researchers can get information they say they can get from biology, which is very, very, very interesting to me. And one more thing about the level of relationship between doctors and patients to be enhanced in this way. It is common today to hear that doctors goes from curating to caring a patient. And I think it should be both because it's real about passion and it's real about uh, compassion also. It's not just uh, technical. It's got to be human because uh, patients are, could be presidents, could be CEOs, could be anybody, could be fathers, mothers, and not just a category. When I read the European Charter of Patients' Rights we have in Europe, uh, I've also found out how much more uh, as a patient we should ask when we usually don't. This chart shows 14 rights. Among them, we have the right to access and information, the right to free choice, the right to privacy, the right to the observance of quality standards, and the right to avoid unnecessary suffering and pain, besides the right to complain and the right to, to compensation. So I've heard people mentioning this, but sometimes not, not enough. I've heard also people calling their cancer in so many different ways. I call it the guy, actually called the residence, even though he's not really paying the rent, but giving a beautiful apartment out here. They say you can stay there as much as you want, just stay as more as you can, you know. And, uh, but the most stupid metaphor I've heard is the bullet. Uh, it's like something that life shot a bullet against us and now resides inside us, we have to extirpate it. The guy ought to say was a cop, so it makes sense, but uh, Cancer is something that grows inside us. So, you know, it's nobody's fault and responsibility. So it's simply a consequence of more factors, as we said. So we experience in our own, sometimes too short, sometimes long enough, 
life. So after all, I mean, I have to say sometimes, uh, but it, I consider myself lucky to have her on my side and besides my beautiful daughter, Leda, who is really my most effective medicine ever tried. And I have a lot, I have a lot to lose. I was healthy or healthier. I thought I had much more to lose uh, just because I was supposed to have much more time than what I have now. So today I can thank this guy, my guy for uh, illuminating me and uh, so many things that I wouldn't have found out otherwise. And for his biggest lesson is given to me every day. And this is to live here now, uh, as simple as that, here now. We're probably gonna have a tattoo on my left arm too. Remember that, just in case I forgot. Because cancer definitely changed our life, but it can change its value. Thank you for listening to me.